Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I apologize, it seems everybody else has rehearsed whereas I came with like sheets of stuff that I'm going to read inshallah. Um, so I was born into a Hindu family where, as uh, Sister Nahela was saying, for the last at least 500 years that my dad kind of just knows off the top of his head. Um, my grandfather and his father and you know, every ancestor going back had been Hindu priests. And uh, I'd always considered myself to be a fairly religious Hindu. I was strictly vegetarian. I'd never drank alcohol. I would pray and I'd sit up at, you know, till the early hours of the morning with my mum uh, discussing my favorite chapter of the Gita. And, you know, this is, we were from a, I wasn't looking for another religion at all. I mean, I thought I was Hindu and that was that. Um, now, for a few months and by some accounts for uh, many years, a story had been developing. We can hear you in the back, so speak up. Inshallah. <laughs> uh, the story had been developing in France and uh, they had banned the wearing of overt symbols of religiosity uh, in French schools and in French public buildings, with the primary focus being on the hijab. Now, their arguments was that um, it wasn't really directed at the hijab, rather as any overt symbols of religiosity, including a large cross and so on, but it was fairly obvious to anybody where their focus was. Um, now, some students at, uh, at this university had, uh, that I was attending had, been, uh, had organized an event discussing the ramifications of this ban, and I just decided to attend purely out of interest from the news. Um, as I said, I wasn't looking for another religion. The audience were a mixture of Muslims, non-Muslims, and some students from France, because it was a London university, so it's fairly diverse. And they were all unified on wanting to learn more about this political situation. So we all listened to the young Muslim speaker eloquently describe the Islamic position. And I'd already assumed that Muslims would want the ban stopped, but I'd never heard anyone describe it in quite this way. Uh, the sisters in France were faced with a choice, the almost unthinkable decision of whether to leave university to abandon their education, to possibly ruin their lives, all for a piece of cloth. And yet somehow, some of those sisters decided to wear the hijab despite the very likely consequences. Uh, this sacrifice and this struggle really struck me. Uh, I wanted to know what motivated them to do what seemed unimaginable, to make the active decision to give up on what the whole of society was expecting of them, to give up on what seemed like the most practical option, and instead to choose the hijab. Uh, so after this talk I attend, uh, I'd attended, I arranged to meet one of the brothers there who was uh, at the same talk and to find out more. I just wanted to understand what was it, uh, out of curiosity, honestly I was just curious to find out and uh, to try and get some answers to some of my questions. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but the person, alhamdulillah, the person I was going to meet would literally change my life and the way I view everything in it. Um, so this brother's name is Majid, and he explained the basis of Islam, the proof of Allah's existence, and the message of the Qur'an. And I remember coming home and telling my mom, uh, guess what, somebody just proved to me that God exists. And my mom was, bear in mind, we're a religious family. My mom was shocked. She said, proof, really? And uh, I mean, she was clearly surprised. And <laughs> subhanAllah. So, I mean, just think about what this was. We thought we understood. I didn't think I needed proof. I thought I'm religious and I know for sure already. Whereas the reality is there is a proof and you can know it. So this brother Majid, he had proved to me that the creator exists the same way that you know that you exist and the chairs underneath you exist. Definite proof. And he went on to prove that the Quran is the literal word of this creator. And it was a proof like nothing I had ever experienced. Uh, although it was emotive, it wasn't emotional. It wasn't based on blind faith. It wasn't even because the Quran contains proven predictions or amazing details of science. It was definite, rational, proven fact. Uh, and what's more, alhamdulillah, I could prove it too. 
So I discussed all of this at home, and I, and I want you to bear in mind, again, that my family was already considered to be amongst the most religious, with these generations of priests. Um, and yet it was a complete surprise to my mum. And it was only at the very end of this conversation where there was a long pause, and I said to her, don't you see what this means? And uh, in disbelief, my mum suddenly kind of took a, te- took a step back and said, wait, you're not going to become Muslim, are you? And uh, I gave the almost rhetorical response that, faced with an undeniable proof, how could I not become Muslim? And uh, subhanAllah, I mean, it was a difficult time for my family. I remember it being very kind of tense and and stressful for them all, subhanAllah. It was, uh, it it felt like a test, subhanAllah. And this proof, this, this same proof that had motivated me was the reason, the motivation for those sisters with the hijab in France. This same proof was the thing that gave them clarity and certainty, especially when they felt like they were being tested. Uh, Can I? Can't I? Should I? Shouldn't I? And this proof was the tipping, was tipping the balance. So with a small gathering of brothers a couple of days later, uh, I said, I slowly said the words, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. And that was followed by a chorus of takbirs and hugs and handshakes. Oh, yeah. and, Allahu 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 Allahu. Allahu. <laughs> and so now I'd like to explain, despite us all being here for, uh, to talk about reversion to Islam, that for me, reversion is not a special moment. Um, it's not a magical decision. It's not like a switch that turns you into Superman. In fact, to be frank, I don't even quite remember the dates that I took my Shahada. Um, So on the face of it, I'd stated this Shahada, but in reality, the Shahada was the start of my test. And within the space of a few months, I'd realized that I'd already started failing those same tests and clinging to my old habits. Uh, And so since becoming Muslim, I started to believe that the best time for me to have died uh, was probably straight after my shahada. And I don't want to give the impression that uh, I was suicidal. (laughs) Far from it, um, I'd just been considering that Allah, in his infinite mercy, had cleared my record of all sin at the time of taking this shahada. And since that time, I was of the opinion that I'd been doing a marvelous job of wrecking my chances of going to Jannah. And with the limited time that I had left, I wanted to make amends. And so steering clear of this haram had been a significant challenge. And indeed, I failed on many occasions. And for this, there is little I could do but make tawbah and sincerely attempt to never repeat those actions. Many things had changed, but perhaps unsurprisingly, the habits I'd spent decades forming during my jahiliya had been the source of most of my tests. And at this time, I noticed that I, all, I almost never felt anything spiritual during my salah. Words like tranquility and peace and joy were used by others to describe their salah, but in all honesty, I'm not even sure I knew then what I ought to have been feeling. Uh, But given that so many people spoke about it, surely they had to be something. Alhamdulillah, I still recognized it as a fart. uh, And so I still prayed. However, uh, to me, this was literally just that, an obligation. Uh, I did it because the Creator had given me a hukum. So this all led to me doing the bare minimum to avoid the hellfire. And even that was usually rushed. And with the exception of the two rak'ah before the Fajr Fard, I would practically never pray any sunnah, never pray any nawafil. And so some people suggested that you know, praying more, more of these voluntary prayers would resolve my situation. But for me, praying more, honestly, uh, led to me just losing concentration altogether. And please understand that I don't mean to be arrogant. Uh, I was still grateful for the kindness and bounty the boundless bounty that my Lord had uh, bestowed on me. But I couldn't seem to link these intellectual facts 
with khushu in salah. And I was impassioned by various aspects of the deen, but the ibadah left me cold. And what worried me most about all of this was that I was beginning to wonder, am I even Muslim? When my thoughts and my actions and my emotions are not in line with Islam. And so seeking guidance, I, uh, I came across these ayat from the Quran, which I'd like to share with you today. Such are the men whom Allah has cursed, for he has made them deaf and blinded their sight. Do they, no, do they then not, not earnestly seek to understand the Quran, or are their hearts locked up by them? Those who turn back as apostates after guidance, guidance was clearly shown to them. The evil one has instigated them and busied them with false hopes. This because they said to those who hate what Allah has revealed, we will obey you in part of this matter, but Allah knows their inner secrets. But how will it be when the angels take their souls at death and smite their faces and their backs? This because they followed that which called forth the wrath of Allah, and they hated Allah's good pleasure, so he made their deeds of no effect. Or do those in whose hearts is a disease think that Allah will not bring to light all their rancor? Had we so willed, we could have shown them up to you, and you would have known them by their minds, but surely you will know them by their tone of their speech, and Allah knows all that you do. And of the over 6,000 ayat in the Quran, I came across these that perfectly described the situation that I was in. I felt as though, despite knowing in my mind that Islam was the truth, perhaps I had stepped back. And everyone born as a Muslim or as a non-Muslim has to make the same active decision to worship their creator. It's a decision that we each, all of us, make many times in our lives and perhaps many times in a day. For example, should I pray or should I attend the meeting at work? Should I get angry at another driver or should I be patient? Should I put it on my credit card or should I avoid riba? Should I speak up for justice or should I keep on walking by? And when I was feeling this struggle most, I reached out to some Muslims I knew and received an email uh, which I'd like to share with you today, inshallah. Uh, I resent, and I'm using that, in, that word in the mildest form, I resent the fact that you say the best time for you to have died was after taking the shahada. I can understand that there's little else that equates emancipation from all previous sins, but would you really have wanted to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without having strived for the deen, without having to fight your nafs for his sake, without having, to, without having propagated his perfect deen. Quoting from Surah An-Nur, Ayah 40, the state of a disbeliever is the darkness in a vast sea, overwhelmed with waves topped by waves, topped by dark clouds, layers of darkness above darkness, and if a man stretches out his hand, he can hardly see it. And for he whom Allah has not appointed a light, for him there is no light. Sounds harsh. SubhanAllah. And the rest of the email. The day you took your shahada, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you out of this darkness and appointed you a light. To die there and then is all too easy. To exert oneself for the sake of Allah every minute of every day is the challenge that all Muslims have been blessed with. I do understand the dilemma though. The thought of Jannah brings tear to my eyes, firstly because I long to be there, and secondly because of the fear that I won't be granted entrance through its gates. Every day is a battle against the haram, and each day holds regrets. I want for my heart to shake with fear, tears to flow, and sheer humility to come over me when I pray. I'm ashamed to say that I've only felt this once in the whole time since I've been praying. My love for Allah defies any words in my vocabulary and at times can reduce me to a silence in my mind. Despite this fact, I don't always give my salah the attention it's due. 
Being the limited creators we are, we need an understanding of our reality in order to make connections to anything beyond it. It is, is it possible for us to feel an instant tranquility and peace through reciting certain words and carrying out certain actions? Being illiterate in Arabic immediately puts some of us at a disadvantage, and it is knowledge of this language which forms the link to the spirituality of Salah. However, I don't believe that just understanding the semantics of the words will fix anything. There exists an understanding that surpasses that. Taking the time to truly reflect is something that I all too often overlook. Apart from the time before Fajr when the quiet of the night is piercing and Allah's presence can be felt, I'm almost too busy thinking about something else. The link is definitely missing. I believe for our actions, thoughts, and emotions to be in line with our fitrah, it takes active application of one to the other. And so that, inshallah, is what I will die trying to achieve. Allah is full of the mercy and kindness that we speak of, and therefore I put my trust in him. And subhanAllah, this email is from eight years ago when I first reverted and it's just as applicable today to me and, and I believe to all Muslims that without this struggle every day, without taking that active decision ourselves at every opportunity that is provided to us, every time we're given another day to live, we, subhanAllah, we will fail. And being a Muslim, practicing Islam is, uh, as the title of this, uh, this event, the pursuit of happiness. Not happiness in itself. Being Muslim is not the completion of a goal. It is the opportunity that we are all blessed with every day to seek the ridwan of Allah. Uh, may our last words be our best words, our last deeds be our best deeds, and our last actions be our best actions, and our best day be the day that we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs>